Welcome back scholars and this video is going to be about total ionic equations and also molecular equations and these are for reactions which largely take place in water as the solvent so these are examples of aqueous chemical reactions all the reactions in these slides none of them have been balanced if you want to use these for practice with balancing uh, feel free to do so uh, in some cases we're worried in these reactions about showing what the reactants and what the products are, not specifically how many of each there are. In some cases, there may even be um, a piece of the reaction that's missing that is an artifact of the type of reaction. For instance, in oxidation reduction reactions, often there's extra H plus or extra hydroxide. These are one of the big kinds of reactions that occur in water. And of course, remembering from biology, Oxidation reduction reactions are reactions where electrons are transferred. There's also single replacement reactions and double replacement reactions. And we're going to go over all of these as a part of discussing total ionic equations and how you know whether something is soluble or not and how you know whether a product is a precipitate or not. And of course, just to briefly remind you of the oxidation reactions, oxidation reduction reactions, where electrons are transferred. If you lose electrons, that's an oxidation reaction. If you gain electrons, that is a reduction reaction. And the um, reaction of oxalate with permanganate is an example of this. And permanganate would be a purple ion in solution. The oxalate would be colorless. When this reaction is complete, there should be no color in the reaction if all of the permanganate has reacted. In this particular reaction, it's the oxalate that's being oxidized, and it's the permanganate, the manganese in the permanganate, that is being reduced. We don't have to know right now how to figure that out. If we've got time later in the course in the semester, if we have to do more than these current three weeks worth of work, then maybe we can get into some uh, oxidation reduction again and talk a little bit about electrochemistry and how batteries work. And one of those kinds of reactions that takes place in a lot of batteries are single replacement reactions. And the way we see these work when we're looking at the compounds themselves is that elements replace ions, metals replace cations, and nonmetals replace anions. And we figure out single replacement reactions by looking at something called an activity series. But again, this activity series is really based on standard reduction potentials. And so in the top right, there's the halogens, and those do go in the order in which they're listed on the periodic table. So fluorine is more active. It is higher on the activity series than chlorine, bromine, or iodine. So the first reaction here on the slide, fluorine gas plus potassium bromide makes potassium fluoride and bromine liquid. That reaction can happen because the fluorine is higher than the bromine and the fluorine can replace the bromine in that compound. However, just below it, the iodine solid and potassium bromide does not result in a reaction because the iodine element is below the bromine. It is less active than the bromine and it is not able to react with it. When it comes to metals, we have a slightly different list. We've got the potassium, sodium, lithium, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, et cetera. And the way that's organized, those top four elements, they are all able to replace hydrogen in cold water. The next two, magnesium and aluminum, can replace hydrogen, but only in hot water. The potassium, sodium, lithium, calcium could still replace hydrogen in hot water. All of those plus zinc and iron are able to replace hydrogen in steam. And then the metals nickel, tin, and lead are only able to replace hydrogen when it's in an acid. And then there on the activity series is hydrogen. And everything below hydrogen is not able to replace hydrogen at all in an acid or in water. Um, and similar to the halogens, all of these metals, they can replace each other as long as they are higher on the activity series. So the example on the left, the, the reaction, the aluminum solid and copper two chloride in solution, 
The aluminum is higher than the copper on the activity series, and so the aluminum replaces the copper in that chloride compound, forming aluminum chloride and kicking out the copper as the elemental solid. Whereas the aluminum and the lithium chloride, the lithium is above the aluminum, so the aluminum is less active than the lithium, and there's no reaction there. So this is how we can figure out what the products are for single replacement reactions, and this is how we can predict whether particular mixtures will actually give us a reaction or not. So double replacement reactions get a little bit more interesting. And in double replacement reactions, the ionic compounds, the strong electrolytes specifically, exist as ions in solution. And those ions are all floating around in the solution and they can react to form more stable products. So that's if they release energy, they're more stable. That tends to be a favorable reaction. The other thing that can happen is they can form products with higher entropy. And entropy is a, an idea that we don't really need to talk about a whole lot this school year um, in this course. For now, think of it as entropy is a measurement of the number of ways of distributing energy. So the more possible energy states that you have, the higher the entropy is for that system. So if you have ions spread out in solution versus ions existing as a solid precipitate, the ions in solution would have higher entropy. Likewise, creating a gas would actually have higher entropy than keeping something dissolved in the solution. So those ions that form more stable products or that form products with higher entropy, we typically call those driving forces for these double replacement reactions. And they're kind of a general guide of what products are lower in energy or higher in entropy. And those driving forces for us are the formation of a gas, the formation of water, or the formation of a precipitate. So as examples of reactions that will form gases, the reaction of iron 2 sulfide and hydrochloric acid will make H2S or hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, using the, uh, the official naming method for that, that would be dihydrogen monosulfide, but it's got a little bit of a common name which people tend to just call it hydrogen sulfide. That would be a gas on its own and it would come out a solution. The ammonium chloride and the sodium hydroxide, looking at that as a double replacement reaction, we would predict that the ammonium and the sodium would switch spots, which would give us ammonium hydroxide. But that ammonium hydroxide is going to be unstable and it's going to break down to form ammonia and water. And it's the ammonia that is the gas that's going to come out from the solution. Likewise, the last reaction, sodium bicarbonate, also known as baking soda, with acetic acid, sometimes called vinegar, will produce a sodium acetate product and carbonic acid. But again, the problem with that carbonic acid is it is unstable and it will actually break down. And you've seen this reaction already. You saw this in the one gizmo. The carbonic acid there breaks down to form carbon dioxide, which is, of course, our gas and water. So a formation of a gas, the gases you can form are H2S, NH3, CO2. There are certainly others that you could form, but these are the main ones and these are the ones we're really going to be concerned with. You could also form water. And in fact, in some of those gas formation reactions, we formed water as well as the gas. But in fact, it is really the gas that's driving that reaction because its uh, entropy is so much higher. So formation of water, a lot of times we see this happen when we have an acid reacting with a base. Not every single acid-base reaction, but acid reactions where there is a hydrogen and bases where there is a hydroxide, 
these will give us the formation of water when the double replacement occurs. We can also see different stoichiometries, and again, it's not balanced, but something like oxalic acid and ferric hydroxide, we will still produce water from that reaction. And so any reaction where you produce water, which again is typically going to be the reaction of a hydroxide compound with an acid, a hydrogen-containing acid, will produce water. The final driving force, the third driving force, is the formation of a precipitate. This really depends on solubility. So things that are soluble or insoluble. And things that are insoluble, aka slightly soluble or low solubility, will be precipitates if they are formed from a double replacement reaction. Likewise, things that are slightly soluble would be weak electrolytes, and they would generally exist in solution as a combined unit rather than the separated ions. And so for the solubility rules that I've got here that are similar, very similar to the ones that you can find in your textbook on page 421, from the top to the bottom for both of these charts, both the one in your, in your textbook and the one here, the top entries are the ones that are mostly soluble or that are soluble all of the time. And so these are our strong electrolytes. And these contain any compounds with group one cations, the alkali metals. So lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium. All of those are group one metals. All of the salts with those metal ions will be soluble. And the same is true for ammonium. So ammonium chloride or ammonium sulfide, those salts are soluble. They are strong electrolytes. Along with the group one metals, anything with nitrate or acetate will be soluble, okay? Anything consisting of those will not be a precipitate. They will always be aqueous in solution, and even more than aqueous, they will always be completely separated. Then we start to get into the compounds that are a little bit less soluble, or they have a few exceptions to their rules. And so most group 17 ion compounds, in other words, the halides, so chlorides, bromides, iodides, most of those are soluble. So iron 3 chloride is soluble. Um, gold 3 chloride is soluble, okay? However, the halides of silver, copper 1, mercury 1, and lead 2 are insoluble. So lead 4 chloride is soluble. Lead 4 chloride is a strong electrolyte but lead 2 chloride is insoluble and would be a weak electrolyte. Lead 2 chloride would be a precipitate. Lead 4 chloride would not be a precipitate. The same is true with sulfate. Sulfate compounds are mostly soluble unless that sulfate is paired with barium, calcium, mercury 1, lead 2, or strontium. Below that, we get into the compounds that are generally insoluble. These are hydroxides, sulfides, carbonates, and phosphates. And again, the only exceptions to these are our group one metals, and in some cases, ammonium. So all sulfides are insoluble unless they are specifically with ammonium, lithium, sodium, potassium, et cetera. So how do we apply these? Well, let's look at a few reactions where we see some possible precipitates formed. So if we start out with everything as aqueous, sodium chloride and lead to nitrate, we swap the cations, we know we're gonna form sodium nitrate and lead to chloride. So the sodium nitrate, if we come back to our rules, our solubility rules, on our solubility rules, sodium nitrate, sodium is an alkali metal, nitrate is nitrate, and so sodium nitrate has two reasons why it would actually be aqueous. The lead to chloride 
Chlorides are halides. That makes us start to think that it falls under here. But then notice that chlorides are soluble except for lead two. So our lead two chloride here is really a solid. Uh, that is our precipitate. How about the next reaction? The barium chloride and the iron two sulfate are mixed. The iron and the barium swap spots. The iron goes with the chloride. Well, we just said that chlorides are soluble, except for these. Is iron one of those exceptions? No, so iron is aqueous. So what about the barium sulfate? Well, the barium sulfate, sulfates are generally soluble, except for, again, here we go, here's the barium. So barium sulfate is a solid. The last reaction, sodium hydroxide and copper two sulfate. The copper goes with the hydroxide, the sodium goes with the sulfate. What do you think about that one? Well, the sodium, you may remember anything with the group one metal is gonna be soluble, so we could say aqueous. We could double check that one and see, yep, sulfate with a few exceptions and sodium is not one of those exceptions. The copper two hydroxide, here we've got a hydroxide and hydroxides, all hydroxides are insoluble except those of group one cations. Is copper a group one cation? Nope, it's in the transition metals. So this copper two hydroxide would be our solid and that would be our precipitate. So just if you need to jot any of them down, here is the slide with the solubility rules. You can pause the video. Last chance to pause. And I'd like you to go back to the page with the four questions about the, or the four situations with the uh, double replacement reactions, asking you to write things like the complete ionic equation. And so we know if we're given aqueous solutions of these two reactants, then those are gonna be aqueous when we start. We can look at those two reactants and we should be able to use those to predict our products. And our products would be barium nitrate. We need two nitrates and H2O. Of course, H2O is water, so that would be a liquid. And the barium nitrate, because it is a nitrate compound, that would be aqueous, okay? This line here is what would be known as the molecular equation. Even though some of these compounds are not molecular compounds, that would still be the name for this. So what you're going to be asked to do today is you're gonna be asked to do the first step in each of these reactions now. And the first step is really to write the molecular equation. And following that, you wanna write the complete or total ionic equation. So some rules for the complete ionic equation. Anything that is not aqueous, like this water, is automatically going to stay together in your total ionic equation. Even if something is aqueous, you have to think about whether it's a strong electrolyte or not. If it is a strong electrolyte, like the barium hydroxide, then it will completely dissociate into ions. So this barium ion has a two plus charge and it's aqueous. That ion is floating around in solution. The hydroxides here, there are two of them. So we have two hydroxide ions floating around in solution. This nitric acid was a strong electrolyte. We also have a hydrogen ion floating around in solution and a nitrate ion floating around in solution. 
So then our only remaining question here is what about the product here with the water is a liquid. It is a molecular compound. It is a non electrolyte. So what about the barium nitrate. Well, we said it was soluble right that makes this a soluble salt and soluble salts are strong electrolytes. So because the barium nitrate is a strong electrolyte, we need to put that down. We have one barium ion aqueous and two nitrate ions aqueous. Now notice as it's written, it's not quite balanced. If we had balanced the reaction originally, we would have said, well, we've got two nitrates here, so we need two nitric acids here. We've got two H's and two OH's, so that means we need two waters. So let's follow that through. If we've got two nitric acids here, that really means we have two H pluses and two nitrates, okay? This is now our total ionic equation. This is as far as I want you to take this for the other three reactions. Now, just to double check what you should have gotten from yesterday for these other compounds, the barium iodide you should have said was a strong electrolyte. The sodium sulfate, you should have said, was a strong electrolyte. So in solution, both of those would split up completely. You need to think about what their products would be. Once you have predicted what the products would be, you would need to think about what kinds of compounds they are. The sulfuric acid is a strong acid. So that also means that it is a strong electrolyte. Now the lithium sulfide, recall that sulfides are generally not soluble. However, lithium is a group one metal, so this will be a soluble salt. And it will be a strong electrolyte. That's the same reason for the iodide and the sulfate. The iodine is a halide. Halides are generally soluble. Barium is not an exception for the halides. Sulfates are generally soluble. Sodium salts are also soluble. And so that's why it's a soluble salt, soluble salt, and soluble salts are always strong electrolytes. So then the final two compounds down here, the CH3COOH, We've got this COOH here, which makes this an acid. However, it is not on our list of strong acids. And so this must then be a weak acid. If it's an acid and it's not on the list of our strong acids, it must be a weak acid, which means this is a weak electrolyte. It would still be aqueous because it's in solution, but it's going to stay together and not break up. So we will not ionize this, or we're gonna say it, we don't ionize in ionic equations. And the sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So it would be a strong electrolyte. So hopefully that gets you started. It again is up to you to not only predict the products here and determine what kinds of electrolytes they are, but then also knowing what kinds of electrolytes they are show how they would exist in solution. For all of these except for the acetic acid so far, they would all be completely ionized. So for the acetic acid, just to get you started on this one for the total ionic equation, this would stay together as CH3COOH 
AQ. Then think about what happens with all of these other ones and think about what you'd have to do to balance these reactions as well. See you in the discussion space. We'll uh, check the answers for these in the next video before we uh, proceed with the next part of solving these questions. So again, for today, all you need to do for these other three reactions is write a total ionic equation showing exactly what would be in solution before and after and making sure that's balanced just like we balanced this, okay?